Welcome to part three of the summer camp webinar series. Our last session will focus on the construction and renovation of primary entrances and the importance of secure vestibules. I'm Laura Fry Weaver. I'm a door opening industry professional and the moderator of today's webinar. I'm a member of the PASS Advisory Council and I'm also the Education Committee Chair. Two of my fellow advisory council members will be presenting today, Ben Crum and Jim Crumbly. Ben is a registered architect who has a focus in crime prevention through environmental design, and Jim's main focus is on risk mitigation and security integration. Today, we will discuss PASS's new white paper on best practices for secure school primary entrances. For those of you who may be new to PASS, the PASS mission is to provide school administrators, school boards, and public safety and security professionals with the information, tools, and insight needed to implement a tiered approach to securing and enhancing the safety of schools based on each school's individual needs, taking into account nationwide best practices and the most effective use of the resources available. Today, we're going to take a look at the different vestibule types talked about in the white paper, the difference between each and their strengths and weaknesses. If you don't already have the, the white paper downloaded, the white paper can be found on PASS's website, along with all the other PASS white papers at passk12.org front slash white papers. We wanted to review a few security givens before we dig into the meat of the webinar. The PASS guidelines takes the best approach to security, the layered approach. Today, we'll be talking about the building perimeter. Each layer includes basic protective elements or components of security. The PASS guidelines recommends that all exterior doors be closed and locked and the door status be monitored throughout the school day, regardless of the tier level of security. The guidelines also recommend that wayfinding signage is in place to direct, to direct visitors to the proper entrance. While this webinar will focus on the building layout and physical security of the doors and the technology available to both secure and communicate to visitors, school districts should remember that the weakest link in any security program is people. If you take a quick look at the sign that the model's holding, you'll see a list of the seven common components found in the layers. The components are not listed in a priority order and not all components are used in every layer, but the three components that are included in all layers are policies and procedures, the roles and training of people and communication. These three components perform a function in every layer and every tier within each layer. Training on policies and procedures must be regularly scheduled and consistently enforced. Jim. Locked doors, access control, and monitoring are critical components to securing any entrance. Assuming the school day has started and all the perimeter doors of the school are closed and locked, what are the key elements for communication and technology that you believe need to be integrated into a secure school entrance? Laura, okay, that's a great question. And uh, technology has changed so much over the last five, six, seven years, and it's changing constantly. So in the old days, um, which I definitely went through, uh, it was just a, a piece of copper wire, uh, and it was a basic intercom the where you could communicate someone. But now you've got network capable devices that you can fully integrate. So um, an important thing for a visitor control is an intercom with video at the visitor entry points. Now within that uh, intercom with the video, you want a clear face view. Um, you want additional cameras in that area as well. So it, as much as possible, getting a, a 360 degree view around somebody who's requesting entry uh, into your school. Uh, you want these um, videos to play, uh, displayed onto a monitor. I mean, there's phones that, that have the video available on it. You can see it, but those screens are rather small. It's better to have something that's a little larger so you really can assess uh, the person, um, uh, you know, any potential risk or threat uh, by the person requesting uh, entry. Um, the uh, video and the monitor needs to be available to the staff member who's controlling that entry point. That staff member needs to be um, well-trained and consistent with every person that walks into that 
uh, door, even if they know the person, even if the person is a parent who's a neighbor down the street, um, they need to walk through the process the same way every time. Uh, forced door and door prop alerts are also very important. So the people understand they if the door has been forced or the door has been propped open, somebody can look at it, figure out what's going on and mitigate that potential risk. Uh, remote release capabilities, the ability to um, hit a button or, or, or if you've got it connected to a SIP phone, you can uh, hit a um, number on it and, sorry, you can hit the number on it and um, the uh, it would unlock the door and then card readers for uh, authorized staff and school emergency personnel. I apologize for the phone call, but today is day one and we handle six different school districts. So it is overwhelming. Thanks, Jim. So what's a vestibule? Historically speaking, a vestibule is a space used to protect the interior climate of the building from the exterior climate initially in colder climate areas where the building would be heated and the vestibule prevented the heat from escaping, but later in warmer climates to keep in the cool air. This space can be turned into a secure vestibule by simply locking the doors. Whether you're locking the exterior vestibule doors, the interior vestibule doors, or both, you've gained a certain level of security, but now what do you do when you need to allow someone to enter? The idea of a secure vestibule can be traced back to medieval times and beyond, when the portico was used to limit the number of people that could come through the castle's main entrance at one time. The exterior opening would be closed and secured before the interior opening would be opened. That system of two secure openings also meant that anyone determined to gain access by brute force would have two layers to overcome. Then, I know many people would consider the vestibule on the left a secure vestibule because you're entering the office and not the school directly. Why the distinction between semi-secure and secure in the white paper? So it's a great thing to kind of bring up because this is um, a little bit of the catalyst for why we kind of looked at this white paper and the idea that uh, a lot of people kind of take that vestibule on the left there and say, this is our secure vestibule. But in reality is it's really only a semi-secure space because people have the ability to bypass the proper path that you want them to, either by tailgating somebody, uh, which is just following them through when they go through the, you know, that door, to somebody from the inside, maybe letting them in to the door, not shutting properly, being, you know, jar uh, unlocked or even propped open. So to really be a secure vestibule, we want to distinguish that it, it should be a separate space so that you're add another layer to the entry sequence from going into the office and not having that access to the building proper without actually making it through the office. Uh, and that also just kind of helps distinguish the difference between where somebody should be going into the building as either a primary user or a visitor. Um, you know, we look at the one on the right that even if, you know, this um, somebody props a door open or the door doesn't work properly, You've only gotten into the office. You haven't gotten into the main part of the building. So it's it's all about you know the, what passes about is those layers, and uh, the more layers we can add, the better. So Ben, why a secure visitor entry center? Is that approach just to solve active assailant threats? No. So the the reason we looked at uh, titling this secure visitor entry center was kind of twofold. There was the fact that we wanted to get away from this distinguish uh, and distinguish the features that make this going to be different than just what people think is a secure vestibule because there's just so much um, confusion in that terminology. So we're trying to just change our mindset there and things. But this is also looking at things of beyond the active assailant and looking at just the day-to-day -day functions that schools face from a security standpoint. So this is more than just a vestibule. Um, it's all about the functions and the screening process. And you know the biggest thing is it provides a safe way for staff to communicate with people uh, as they're coming through. Um, the, idea, the idea being that it's going to be more inviting, more customer service focused, and ultimately the goal is to deter people from trying to bypass the system and just slip through and to properly go through the check-in process because they have to. So we could spend an entire webinar discussing security glazing, and believe me, I have. We won't spend a lot of time today discussing it, but you'll notice in several of the images that security glazing is called out. We couldn't achieve a secure vestibular entry without protecting the glass in some manner. 
Whether it's by using ballistic glass, force protection glazing, or security films, the glass needs some protection. But it's not just a matter of the glass itself, the framing, the light kits, the location of the glass all need to be taken into account. You can incorporate all kinds of mechanical or electrified locks and access control. But if your entire opening is made of glass, you don't have the protection you believe you do. Security glazing works to delay an active threat, buying precious time to be able to defend against an attack or an intruder or to deter it from escalating. So Ben, why the change in nomenclature from secure vestibule to secure visitor entry center and how do they differ? Well, so for the for a tier one approach here, one, uh, first thing I want to note is that you know the diagrams that we showed in the white paper are just to kind of show an example of the concept and not as by any means the only way that this can be done or be arranged. Um, you really need to consider your school's needs, the functions, um, the amount of space you need, number of staff, et cetera. So uh, what we're just trying to show is kind of that con those concepts. So again, just trying to get a little bit away from what people might say is a secure vis um, vestibule, but looking at you know having that secure visitor entrance, meaning that all the doors are going to be locked. There's going to be one point of access for visitors to come in. The tier one approach is really a recommendations for existing buildings that face um, you know, uh, constraints because of just how they're in, you know, laid out now, mainly that they have a remote office. And by remote office, what we're really talking about is anything that from what was shown here, something maybe across the hall, maybe it's adjacent to the, you know, the entrance, but you have to go into the corridor to get to the office, um, or it could be something that's completely somewhere else in the building. That was something that was, you know, popular, you know, 40, 50 years ago, where the, you know, the office was central to the educational needs rather than the front entrance. So the, the main idea is that there's no direct connection between the vestibule and the office. Um, and because of that, what we're looking at is, you know, the idea that we need to supplement physical um, attributes with procedural when they don't work. So while we have all the doors locked and then we're, you know, we're recommending installing a communication device, be it, you know, ideally a video doorbell, as Jim was talking about prior, um, that alerts you to somebody being out there, then somebody's going to have to come down to the office and escort that person to the office um, and back and forth so that they're not just kind of left on their own um, in the main part of the building and, you know, can just disappear down a hallway without you knowing about it. So there's many ways that we I think you can handle that. Um, Jim, do you want to address those? Jim, I, Jim you're muted. Sorry, as far as the multi-step verification process goes, I mean, obviously the first step is everyone should uh, have a proper state or, or federal photo ID, some type of a driver's license or a state ID, anything with a picture on it is uh, is uh, appropriate. Uh, then um, as uh, someone's trying to come to school, you are going to ask them some questions. What is the purpose for visiting the school? Uh, uh, again, it's a, it's a script that everyone should be reading same way every single time. Uh, have a sign-in visitor log, either a physical sign-in or uh, something on a computer uh, that includes the name and the phone number of the person requesting entry. Uh, provide a visitor's badge that has the date. Again, it goes back to uh, role, uh, processes and policies and training. If someone see, if a staff member sees somebody walking to the school that doesn't have a uh, staff ID or a visitor's ID, they can stop them and ask them if they can help them and make sure that they're in there appropriately and get them to the right area. Uh, we want to screen the visitor with some type of a, a red flag list that the school district may have. If it's a parent that uh, a parent or another visitor has created a problem at school in the past, or maybe a different school within that district, there should be a process for notifying everyone uh, so that uh, there is a, a means to inter, interact with that person and vet their purposes and handle it uh, appropriate and coordinate your own policies. And when possible, it's a great idea to run that person's name through the visitor, uh, through a uh, sex uh, child sex protection program or something like that. So that again, you're vetting people before they come into the school, before they gain entry, into the school, you're vetting them uh, and making sure that they're appropriate and safe for your facility. 
So our tier two uh, approach then, you know, recommendations is looking at what uh, I think is most probably one of the most common vestibules we see in our schools today is that shared vestibule with direct access to the office. And this has always been treated as a secure vestibule because, you know, people think that, you know, the interior doors are going to be locked, but it's important to still note that this is really is only semi-secure for, you know, the reasons that we discussed prior. So the difference then becoming turning this into a secure visitor entry center is really about looking at those key components that are within that process, um, mainly kind of getting the uh, ability for somebody to talk from the office to the person standing in that vestibule, ideally through the secure glazing, um, putting your uh, visitor management system in the vestibule so that they have to pass at that process before getting into the next you know, step. Uh, and then also having the ability to pass small items um, back and forth because it's always, you know, 80% of what people come to the school for is somebody forgot their lunch, somebody forgot a book, we're picking up paperwork, dropping paperwork off. It's things that they don't necessarily need to be in the office for, um, so we do that there. So this is just kind of showing that one example, but we can make that a little better by dividing that space and looking at now we've kind of subdivided it where uh, the space that somebody's going to be standing and waiting to go through the process is different than where maybe staff are coming through so we can eliminate some of that tailgating concerns, but we still have those issues of maybe somebody props the door open lets you know opens the door from the interior and things. Um, so the idea there still being, you know, we can have that space that we can have somebody go through the next steps of the vetting process in a secure manner. Um, and the big part of that is the safety of your staff in the office. So in talking about that secure glazing, um, it, what that looks like is to allow the ability to have that direct fit, you know, more of that face-to-face -face communication with people. And then adding to that is the ability to maybe pass some small items. This is just two examples of the ability to kind of pass items through. Um, you know, they have the teller tray and maybe pass paperwork or the drawers or boxes to kind of be able to pass smaller items. Um, all of these are different rooms that you can find separate, combined and things. Um, and they're also offered in different levels of security. So again, you can kind of do assessment on what your threat levels are and where do you think that appropriate level of security needs to be for your building. When we take that then into the tier three, the main part here is the idea that we've separated that visitor entry door from the main entry sequence. Uh, and what that allows for is a truly secure kind of space because that person is going to be contained in an area that they don't have access to the main part of the building. They can't tailgate in. They can't be let in by somebody else. Um, and if the door doesn't shut properly or, you know, they get through it somehow, they've still only made it into the office area and we still have another layer that we can prevent them to get into. Um, I think that, you know, the big thing to note in here is the fact that by having that separate space, then, you know, your staff kind of ends into a different zone where they can talk to that person. And if things get heated, um, that person doesn't really have many options of where they can go, what they can do in there. So this allows the, the, the steps of the, you know, those multiple uh, steps of the verification process to be reflected in the physical attributes of the building and not just trying to do everything in one place. So, um, you know, Jim, you were talking about that a little bit, but, you know, a little bit more here on the, you know, tier three level. Yeah, I think that that is really important for us to understand that, again, to, to emphasize, we're talking about principles here. There's no cookie cutter approach that you can take to any of this. Every building is different. Uh, every facility is is different, uh, you know, uh, and and it's it's not always possible to do exactly what Ben has detailed this, but you can put bits and pieces of each one of these principles together to create a secure environment. And then as, as you're dealing with a secure visitor entry center, um, I'm, I'm thinking that as I look at it, it's very customer service forward. It's very customer service focused. So as people are coming in, they're not looking at it like, oh my gosh, why am I having to go through all these steps? You're you're actually able to, uh, the staff member is able to give more of one-on-one -on -one attention to that person, not only figure out are they appropriate to visit, but help and make sure that they get to the right person at the right time. Uh, you know, Ben talked about uh, staff, the staff bypass and piggybacking. That again goes into training. It goes into proper uh, roles and um, uh, processes and policies so that staff members know if somebody walks up and they're walking behind them while they are using their card reader, they need to stop and direct them over to the uh, secure visitor entry center 
or if it's a, a lower tier to one of the secured doors that they should go in so that they're not piggybacking into it. All of this lays out uh, enhanced security and enhanced customer service. And that's what people expect. So the next kind of step to this, and this has kind of been the a kind of we looked at as a stepped approach to getting to, you know, the ideal, which would be a secure, you know, not only the secure entry center, but adding to that, then the secure administration zone. And the, what we're looking at there, then, is basically looking at an area that the entire administration function is in a space that can be isolated and, and remain secure. And then within that, recognizing that we want to have a secure visitor zone where we accommodate all the functions that we can try to get that a person would be at the building for. Um, so if, the, you know, with the secure visitor entry center, if we have the what means to pass, you know, small packages or a table to leave them on, like I, said, I think we probably accommodate 80% of the people who come to the building just to drop something off, pick something up. The people that are there for a meeting with administration, then we need access to a conference room um, address to restroom facilities. And depending on how your building functions, there might be certain offices that you want to have within that secure visitor zone as well, uh, particularly things like registrar's offices and, um, you know, principal's office, if that's something that they feel that they would be in there. Um, but then looking at that from that the you know, the rest of the administration zone is still secure from that space so that somebody can't get from there into the other places and they can't get from that out into the building. Um, and those are going to be controlled by doors that are under kind of access control. Um, all of this is kind of looking at it in the sense that, you know, the, the um, you know, the examples that we showed in the tier one or the tier two, tier three would be what we consider kind of a satellite main office there, which would be at the front, but all the maybe the rest of the office functions could be somewhere else in the building um, until you can kind of bring them all into in house into one one area. But this, I think, would be the ideal situations for having that administration function towards the, you know, entrance, especially where you're bringing visitors. Um, the other thing to note here is now we've tried to move that visitor entry door further away from the main entrance. And that could be done even more by moving that you know, that administration function away from those entry points. Um, and the big thing there is just allowing you from kind of a natural surveillance standpoint, being able to recognize where people are moving around on the site and are they in the areas that we want them to be? And then they become very distinguishable when they're in areas that we don't want them to be um, hanging around a door, maybe waiting for staff members to kind of come out and trying to get in through that means and stuff. So um, this starts to look at kind of the whole and um, bringing this you know, kind of full circle. So, and yeah, when you when you talk about this level, you're really talking about new construction and uh, or major renovations. But this is ideal. Uh, it is very customer service focused. Uh, people know exactly where they go. You need to have good signage. There needs to be a signage around your campus that directs visitors to the proper location, to the proper door, and that there's a firm understanding of the process for gaining entry. Uh, and it should be in multiple languages because uh, schools are uh, working with families where English is a second language. And so you need to look at what languages are predominant in your community and make sure your signage and your instructions can uh, help with that. Additionally, any um, uh, hearing impaired and sight impaired uh, visitors should have uh, the ability, should have some type of an ability to help with those if, if you have uh, uh, students or parents that have those impairments, you need to be able to have a process for helping that as well. Uh, all of these are part of your hol holistic security package that's important, not only in this tier four, but in every tier that you have. So Ben, how does a school with an existing building get from where they are now, not having a secure visitor entrance to the tier three or tier four recommendations? So that's a great question because that's I think what a lot of the schools are facing these days. Um, obviously, tier four is achievable if you have if you're going to have new construction, you have the the freedom to kind of do what we want. Um, but trying to get from what you have to what you can, you know, that ideal tier tier four, um, is it can be a challenge and it can be expensive because of just the restraints that you you know your your building might face. So 
what we really try to look at with the tiers and the past guidelines is that stepped approach that will get you to that tier four. So, you know, our tier one recommendations, um, you know, obviously not for new construction. That is if you have the existing building, how can we get you more secure very quickly? And that's where our tier one recommendations are. Lock the doors, put the access control, video doorbell um, system in, and, you know, that at least gets you secured and monitoring it, but recognizing that you're going to have to supplement quite a bit with, you know, policies and procedures and people having to shuffle things around. Um, you know, moving then towards kind of that tier two, tier three level for renovation purposes, you know, if the office isn't at the front, we can maybe do a satellite office up at the front and get at least to, you know, that tier three. Then um, for those of you that have kind of the, you know, the shared vestibule already, um, just kind of looking to maybe make those upgrades to get it to more of the tier two, the ability to have that direct communication between the office and the people in the secure vestibule. Maybe it's, you know, adding the divider uh, recommendation just to kind of split some of the traffic and things in there. Um, but eventually getting to the point where that entire administration area can be put towards the front there, um, attached to that first part of the office and reception area. So it's important that if you're going to take this through, you know, stepped approach, it might take a few years to get there. Um, don't box yourself in. You know, you don't want to design a, uh, an entry vestibule that is, you know, in the middle of everything uh, that doesn't connect to anything else. And you don't have the option to renovate a few classrooms to your administration suite later on. So, you know, you can look at it from two perspectives. You know, maybe you need to find space between, you know, classrooms at the front of the building that can serve the purpose of administration and, you know, move stuff around. Um, maybe it's, a, you know, needs to be looked at as additions to the front of the building to do that. Um, and sometimes it's looking at the, the picture as a whole and recognizing that the administration function might be better served somewhere else than right, you know, adjacent to that main entry. Um, having it near the main entry is great just because it gives you that passive surveillance, um, you know, for everything else kind of happening through the day. So those, again, you know, yeah, the, the ideal to get to is going to be that tier three kind of secure visitor entry center tier four with the secure administration zone um, is what you want to be shooting for and and getting there in the stepped approach is just kind of our, our different tier levels to move you in that direction um, so that it is achievable and it's not something that well you know it's going to take years to do because of it it's going to require renovations and Ben, I think it's also important as we talk about the tiers and the tier approach, what we try to do within the past guidelines is to give schools options, because we know that it's difficult for somebody to come in and, and you know, a consultant can come in and say, do this, this, and this, but a school needs a process uh, to be able to achieve the upper tiers. It's going to take time. It takes budgeting. It takes major renovation sometimes. But that doesn't mean your security is, is not what it needs to be. And you can take these principles of the tiers and you can apply them to your environment and to your uh, building layout. And so I, uh, for instance, I have one district uh, that I work with that, that because they have remote offices in a lot of their schools, they would be more of at a tier one for their vestibules. So to combat that, they moved a visitor's desk out into the front entrance area so that now the person has line of sight. They can directly communicate using a video intercom. They can release the door. Um, they have card readers on the door, but they limit who has uh, rights to those particular doors. So it's administrators, uh, SROs, uh, maintenance personnel, and they're specifically trained to not allow piggybacking. So you don't, you know, you don't have all 110 teachers with cards at your school that maybe need access to that front area. And really, you know, that kind of takes it into a 1.75 tier. Maybe it's not quite a two, but it's at 1.75. And so you can feel better about your security by getting creative uh, to on your layout and understanding the principles behind these different tiers, the principles behind what PASS recommends for vestibules and other uh, um, areas, you know, uh, video uh, access control, physical doors, things like that. You can understand by understanding those principles, you can actually enhance enhance your security and prioritize based upon what you need to bring the whole school uh, into a compliance and a safer, B, safer environment. 
Well, and I think that prioritization is is key for what the PASS guidelines does. Um, you know, as, as passionate as I am and an advocate for the, you know, the tier three, tier four recommendations for a secure visitor, you know, entrance sequence, um, if the rest of your building's at a tier one kind of level, there's probably a lot of other stuff that we need to start addressing before maybe investing in that tier four renovation uh, to bring the entire administration suite, you know, to the front. So that is one of the areas where the the, you know, the guidelines, the checklist allows for that uh, with the past guidelines is that, you know, you can kind of look down through this from a, the, from the holistic approach and look at not only the entrance sequence, but how that fits into kind of everything else. Um, if we went to a tier four level, you know, secure entrance there, but don't do anything to secure the rest of the doors around the building, we've still left a lot of vulnerabilities there. So we're, you know, you know, the recommendations there from security consultants might be to kind of focus more to getting to a tier one, tier two kind of level and, can, you know, getting the rest of those doors secure rather than focusing on just getting the secure uh, entrance to a tier four kind of level. And that's that team approach that we emphasize as well, where you're bringing uh, uh, all players, facilities, safety, at school administrators, somebody from the superintendent's office everyone together to develop a security plan for your particular school after you conduct a local assessment, uh, risk assessment, and developing that plan. Often what we see uh, nationally is that uh, maybe some money becomes available for vestibules as an example. So somebody goes to facilities and they say design a vestibule. And so they design a vestibule, but if they're not pulling in safety and security and pulling in school administrators and principals, maybe what they're designing is not gonna work for that environment. And if you bring the and uh, have that team approach, you're actually making a better investment uh, into your security and you're enhancing the security and safety of your staff and your students and making the getting the most bang for your buck as you're investing in into uh, enhancing uh, vestibule security, cameras, access control, what have you. Well, I think that was something with talking about secure glazing earlier on is, you know, we didn't really kind of touch on that on the white paper, you know, we, you know, we started with looking into it for the next revision of guidelines, but what's the appropriate level? I think obviously, you know, getting some type of the force protection glazing, um, you know, around those front entrances and particularly, you know, other entrances around the school is really important as well. Um, I think that's something that people are going to look into. The, the issue that runs people, I think, run into with that is when you're looking at understanding the differences between secure glazing. Um, and I think a big component there is the idea that there's force protection or force entry protection style glazing and there's ballistic rated glazing. And understanding those um, where the, the testing for those kind of develop from um, with the older force protection kind of stuff kind of coming out of the prison systems that now the... Um, yeah, the, there's a new test at ASTM F3561-22, which is geared directly towards, um, for, you know, forced entry protection after a, a simulated active assailant. So, you know, that looks at, you know, once the glass has been damaged, it has to stay within the frame. And that's a really important factor that often gets overlooked when talking about secure glazing is, uh, particularly with films, is it's not just the glass, it's not just the film that's part of the system. It's talking about the frames, it's talking about the walls, how it's attached into there. Um, it's kind of everything. So, you know, older glass that might not, you know, just be single pane plate kind of glass in a, a 1950s metal frame might not be a candidate for just getting a film onto it. You might have to look at replacing the whole system. Um, systems that are maybe a little bit newer, they have a little more integration to them. They might not have as great a rating as something else new, but, you know, the films will work with them. So, um, yeah. our, you know, I know we recommend really getting with professionals on that level to uh, evaluate your needs and what they're going to be doing, uh, but then also being realistic on what, you know, the performance of this, these uh, security glazing is going to do and where it's appropriate to put it in your particular building um, and looking at your threat profiles and noticing where, you know, it might be worthwhile stepping up, or, you know, um, different levels in these different aspects. And you really look at then between, you know, those front entrances, that secure entry vestibule, um, you know, the idea that, you know, this is really going to be looking to solve those day-to-day -day kind of security concerns, not just the active assailant. But uh, I always use the example, you know, that parent that's in a custody battle who's 
yelling and screaming at your receptionist saying that, you know, that they're not leaving without their kid and they've already made it into the office and that person just has a counter between them. So, you know, by looking at this from the secure visitor entry center, you know, we, we have a, a better way to kind of contain them and keep your staff people feeling you know, empowered to be safely. Uh, and the fact that they can just walk away from it and there's not much that person can do when they're, you know, we do have them contained. So th there's a lot that kind of gets addressed in, in you know, kind of changing this mindset for how the secure uh, entrance should happen. And I think this was kind of an important factor in what we were trying to take a look at. Yeah. And, and also just to throw out one more uh, quick point or emphasize one more quick point, and that is that um, the, the assessment of your whole school is, is important. So every time you look to increase security, whether it's a vestibule or a, a camera uh, upgrades or access control upgrades, whatever, you should assess the entire school because what good is it to secure that front entry and have this huge investment when you have two or three doors on the rear of your buildings that don't shut all the way every time somebody goes out of them. And so you're investing in something that's very, very important, obviously, but you need to look at the holistic, take a holistic approach to every aspect of your security. Don't just look at it. You can't silo cameras, access control, vestibule, training. All of it has to work together to build the security. And then you're, you're dealing not only with, like Ben has mentioned, it's not just the act of threat. It's the day-to-day -day security concerns that every school system faces. Uh, people using um, a, a building as a shortcut. We've run into that before. Uh, they, you know, obviously they'll use the... Uh, the playground area and other areas as a shortcut. We've actually had people come in and try to use the building itself as a shortcut, especially if it's raining. These things happen on a day-to-day -day basis because the doors don't secure in the back area. And so it's really important to make that, again, that I'm emphasizing over and over, but that holistic approach to your security plan, looking at the past guidelines, looking at the tiers, understanding the principles behind those tiers, and then developing a security plan that includes all of this that you can phase in based upon the local needs and the uh, local risk. So questions, um, if anybody has any questions, please enter them into the question pane. We'd like to spend some time being able to answer those things. We've had a couple come in. Um, so the first question was, what do you recommend for accommodating visitors with disabilities while still maintaining security? So I'll, I'll give a shot at answering that and then I'll toss it off to, to you guys. So you, you can incorporate um, ADA operators, automatic operators um, into your access control system. Uh, in tier one, where we have indirect communication, where you might have a staff member escorting somebody through the building, you know, that's perfectly acceptable to escort a visitor um, who might have a disability through the building. Um, but it's also um, perfectly fine in the in the other levels where you might have video communication or where you have early on video um, doorbells to be able to either um, actuate your door actuator with your access control system. So just turn it on momentarily to allow somebody to push that button and let themselves in. Or you might have a button in the um, office that um, whoever's monitoring those doors and allowing people in the doors um, is able to actuate that auto operator for them. So that's a, a fairly simple integration um, as long as you contact somebody who you know understands those types of products. Yeah, I think from a physical standpoint, obviously, you know, the space is going to have to be designed to be every ADA you know, uh, guidelines out there, which is going to be not just the size and shapes of the space, how doors are laid out, but then mounting heights for, you know, uh, those communication devices, the window sills, um, you know, computer stations, anything like that is going to have to meet those ADA requirements. Um, particularly, you know, and there's there's options out there that we've you've used in projects that are adjustable height. Um, uh, computer stations that allow somebody to kind of put it down to that seated position, but also raise it right up to kind of a standing height position and everywhere in between, which seems people like. Um, 
I think, you know, that also kind of comes in, as, as Laurie mentioned, you know, it's easy to kind of put actuators into doors and you use that as part of your controlled entry and sequence when you entry sequence process that if you need to let somebody like that into the office as the exception to the rule, that's something that a policy procedural kind of a thing can address. Um, might just just need to be you know a way to kind of help um, you know kind of deal with some of those special circumstances that you know aren't, aren't a one size fit all. Right. What you what you want to make sure that doesn't happen is that auto operators are not tied into the access control. I've been to lots of facilities where the doors are locked and I go depress the actuator and I'm able to get into the building. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to, to those things and the integration of those types of products. We have a question um, coming in about glass. It says you've mentioned film for the glass, but if new glass is being installed, is it recommended to use laminated glass? I think this was in the white paper. Can you comment on this and how it relates to ASTM F3561-23? Um, it was updated this year, this, this, the standard. Yeah, Ben, that's going to be on you. Yeah, I, th um, I think that there's, uh, if, you're, if you're going to be putting in new glass, definitely you want to be kind of looking at the laminated options um, and not just putting kind of a film on something else. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers out there, you know, who, who kind of sell the film also, you know, manufacture um, laminated glazing options, insulated glazing panels. Um, so that all kind of becomes, you know, the importance of understanding where uh, your particular, you know, needs and stuff are. Um, if you are kind of putting in, um, you know, new glass, um, like I said before, you know, it's not just glazing that you have to be looking at, it's going to be kind of incorporating, you know, kind of everything. So um, you, most of the, the glass that, you know, we see for the force protection is a laminated style glass because it has the, that film just becomes part of that lamination. Um, once you start getting into more of the ballistics and uh, rated stuff, you you kind of get out of the glass ratings and you start getting into different polymers and you know plastics and stuff that have to be treated um, treated a little bit differently than maybe just a glass uh, a true true glass and stuff to it. So um, yeah, it opens up lots of uh, uh, challenges as you're trying to determine what's your best approach with all of this. Uh, as you look at it. Uh, again, it's a big investment doing laminated glass, doing glazing. That's a, an investment. And again, taking it holistically and looking at things, you've got more than one entry into your school. And then you have to assess, okay, what about these rear entry points? Do I need to worry about uh, uh, laminated glass or or glazing on these areas. And then um, again, you make that investment in all of that and you have doors that don't close properly. It's all part of that holistic package. You can't silo it. Everything's important, but they're important because they fit together. Um, the only thing else to note kind of on the standard is and those those testing procedures are around the the system as a whole I meaning it's the glass the you know the the laminated portion of it the type of glass that's put into it um, and then the framing systems themselves so to achieve those you know the ratings from those standards um, that it's it's looking at those as a whole if you're not familiar with that uh, that standard the way the testing on that happens is they uh, basically shoot a projectile through uh, in a set pattern and then they start pounding on it and it's you know has to take so many blows and so many weights and things like that to um, kind of simulate an attack but um, that that's the important factor in understanding how those tests are developed I, um, that's also one of the things I was you know we look at the ballistic testing those are meant to stop projectiles at a certain velocity certain quantities things but there's nothing in that test that says after it passes that the next projectile can go right through it. I can walk up to it, push it right out of the frame. It can fall out. It's past that test. That's the only, you know, the part that it's uh, kind of been tested to. So um, understanding that and knowing, you know, the limitations of maybe what those, you know, how those tests are done and, uh, you know, what the ratings are, um, are, are kind of important now. So to my, to my knowledge, I don't, you know, believe that there's, the films are allowed to kind of carry a rating because of the, the variables and factors 
in that you know glass is going to be different you know the you know the uh, infield installation could you know can change things so you'll see a lot of those um kind of be, you know come with somebody saying that you know it would be an equivalent rating um as long as you know the glass would meet you know the standards that are put forth in the test and stuff but um it's it's something that is is looked at quite a bit just because it's um a less expensive alternative to replacing all your glazing so you know, it it's it is worth looking at um i also always have to note that then if you put secure glazing you have to look at your entire wall system because you know if you put a great security glazing rating in in a wall but then you know the wall right next to it i can you know somebody can get through um or you know is in an equivalent rating you, you've kind of put a band you know a uh, band-aid on the hole and you still have vulnerabilities I've got another question for you. So how do you handle areas for deliveries, um, such as food for lunch services? Um, do, should should folks like that be be directed through the visitor's entrance? Well, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, in short, yes, uh, there should be um, they, they need to be vetted. Um, I I like the concept of, you know, we had to pass the window that, that we showed you guys earlier. That is a good process for passing something into an office area and you don't have to release a door to get them inside and it makes it quicker and easier. Uh, and again, that, that's part of that local assessment. What risk do you face? Uh, what type of environment do you have? What's your culture? All of that ties into place. But uh, an easy, easy solution that I've seen work really well is that within the vestibule, uh, they have a table. And if people are dropping off lunches, things like that, they're able to come in. They vet them at the front door, just like they usually do. But they don't go into the office or into the school. They just say, hey, this is for um, Jim Crumbly's son. And you put it on the table and then you're able to leave. And then the staff member, when they have time, or maybe when there's several of them that are out there, they can go and retrieve the package and come back inside. That seems to work out really well. Yeah, I, I kind of concur with that. I mean, it's it's one of those where, um, you know, if, that, if that's taking place at, their, you know, at the, the office, I think, you know, bringing that person into that visitor entry center and, you know, like you said, either passing it through or having a table there that they can set them on. Um, or, you know, if you have access control cards to your, to your staff that are kind of ordering these lunches, they need to kind of go outside to meet, you know, a person um, for delivery. But um, I, I think the importance there is that, you know, that's, you know, that multi-step verification process is, you know, as we kind of walk through it, we only take the person through the steps that they absolutely need to. So, you know, by somebody ringing the doorbell and saying, I'm here to drop a lunch off, that's a valid reason to get into the next layer, not maybe a valid reason to have to go further, go through the visitor management system, because they're just dropping the lunch off, turning around and leaving. So we don't run them through the entire process, but we run them through the, you know, up to the portion they need to. And then, you know, that's where the physical is kind of reflecting that, that, um, they didn't get in the whole way into the office without going to our visitor management. They didn't go th into the building just because they had a somewhat legitimate need to get into the building. Okay. If anybody else has any other questions, we have a few minutes left. Um, I'll, I'll give a second for some folks to enter some things. Is there anything else that you wanted to add, Ben or Jim? Oop, I think you're muted, Jim. The only thing I might add is this. Uh, it's like I'm a rookie here. But the only thing I might add is that um, this takes time. A vestibule is not something you can you can churn out quickly and, and easily. It's something that has to be budgeted for. You have to have designs. It's, it is a process. Until you get there, there are some technology enhancements that you can use to increase your security at that door. So even if you don't have a vestibule, you've got a main entry, you can secure that main entry with access control. You can have uh, a, a video intercom at that area. You can have cameras put up, displayed on a monitor, and it almost becomes a virtual uh, vestibule. You go through the exact same process that you would if you had a physical vestibule, 
And that can buy you time while you're budgeting and uh, coming up with designs for vestibules for your individual school. So I just want to remind everyone that the technology is there to enhance the safety of your school, of your students and your staff. And it does buy you some time while you come up with the proper designs for the vestibules, which is really the uh, becoming the national standard going forward. And, that, and that's something important, I think, you know, where we, you know, with the tier two, tier three, where we were recommending having that communication with secure glazing. Um, I mean, I've seen a, a lot of vestibules where the reception desk is further away from where the, you'd have to renovate that whole space to get a direct line of communication via a window. Um, so a virtual direct communication is possible, but that, you know, would rely on a two-way video stream so that, again, you're not just, somebody's not just talking to a call box, they're talking to a monitor that has a person's face on it. Um, it just, it kind of re reinforces that customer service side of things. But that allows you to have that conversation still with that person being in the vestibule rather than just bringing everybody into the office to have the conversations. Um, it, again, buying you the time, adding the extra layers into the system. Um, I think the other part in noting with, you know, when we say putting a visitor management system in that secure vestibule, um, there has to be a back-end monitor on that as well, so that this person in the office is seeing what people are entering in, they're watching this, the, the ID get scanned, that they can verify that, and then approve the badge being printed, and not just somebody entering whatever information they want. Um, and because they got a badge, they're allowed in. You need to make sure that you're, you know, you're still able to monitor that process and, you know, potentially assist in it when somebody has an issue or something. Um, so there's, you know, there might be more technology involved of having separate monitors for the same system then than just one, if it were in the reception office itself. Okay, so, Thank you all for joining. If you'd like to reach out to Ben, Jim, or me, we would love to hear from you. You can find our contact information here and on the PDF of the presentation made available um, for you to download. We had one more question come in. I'll, I'll throw it at you real quickly. Um, did, uh, did we address at all um, people getting into the vestibule um, for instance, outdoor cameras, do you think that they should be monitoring um, outside as well as the um, video cameras? Well, yeah, absolutely. I think, Jim, yeah. you, you kind of mentioned on this earlier, but I, I would say, you know, that the video doorbell system is great, but, you know, you should probably be linked to at least three other cameras. Yeah. Um, you know, you can get the four, you know, split screen thing then. Um, but that's looking at the area around the entrance, the pathway leading up to the entrance, and, you know, ultimately out to where, you know, visitors might be parking or something, depending on, on your layout, so that you're able to monitor that process of somebody kind of walking up to the building and seeing that. Um, you know, having those extra cameras around that area allow you to kind of see that um, and see, you know, see somebody approaching and making sure that somebody's not out of frame from what, you know, your single camera waiting to kind of jump in with that person or something, you know, um, to the, you know, the Atlan AI, I mean, AI is emerging and the technology is going to be there. Um, I think some of the easiest things to do in that is being able to kind of alert staff as somebody's approaching to it. So it's not necessarily as, you know, just when they ring the doorbell, but when they're in that area that we've defined as, you know, the approachment zone or something, um, you know, people, you know, you're starting to see, you're starting to do something that you can start the process without having to wait necessarily to that. You're starting to kind of um, observe and be able to vet the person prior to, you know, them ever ringing the bell. Yeah, and I, I love this question because it really speaks again, I keep saying it, but that holistic approach. And you can use AI not only at your main entrance, but some of your rear areas of your school. So you, if you have locations uh, in your school uh, on the exterior, rear doors, things like that, where really no one should be. You can use analytics to generate alerts uh, with cross-line detection, loitering, things like that, that can help you um, create a safer environment. Yeah, I think the other thing to note then is that, you know, those, those cameras can all be tied into recording, you know, events that if, as soon as somebody rings that bell, four cameras are recording that 
you know, quote, event as it's happening, that if you have to go back and take a look at things, you know, you've, you've got all that footage then of, you know, the person, you know, different angles, um, you know, of how they were coming up to the building, et cetera, if, if you need it and stuff. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot that you can do with the systems once you kind of get everything kind of installed and working together. Teresa is asking, we run into issues with being welcoming and open to all with security. Do you have any suggestions to overcome that? I think for starting kind of from the physical standpoint that, you know, the idea of this visitor entry center is, is to create that warm, inviting area so that it doesn't feel like, you know, we mentioned earlier that you're, you're going through kind of heavy security. Um, and that's just, again, trying to kind of keep some of that openness, um, you know, within the, you know, the physical itself. Um, and I think then it's kind of getting into how you interact with everybody um, allows for, for some of that then as well. Um, Jimmy probably can talk to that a little bit more on, you know, from the, the policy procedure portion. Yeah, absolutely. I think that as, as you look at it, the policies and procedures, they need to be clearly articulated, very understood by everyone and consistently enforced. I think that's the most important thing uh, uh, that we all have here is if, uh, if you've got policies, you've got to train your people and they've got to consistently enforce those policies. Yeah, I think it's tricky for all of us. We see somebody, you know, coming behind us with, uh, you know, packages in their arms or, you know, they're running for the door and you're walking in and you want to be polite and hold it for them. Um, but, you know, there's there's a, a fine line where you're compromising your security by allowing somebody you don't know um, if they should be there um, into the building. I think I think there needs to be consistency for all as is the way that you kind of have to address it. And um, just even if it's a you know, person, parent who's who's coming to the school on a daily, weekly basis, they are going to have to be treated the same way as somebody who's showing up for the first time, um, so that you know everybody kind of sees that you know the the policies are the policies for for everybody, and everybody goes through the same procedure. That so, you know, therefore there's no kind of special treatment, and it it kind of keeps it on that level playing field. I think that's it for us then. So thank you again, everybody, for joining. And um, we'll see you on the next PASS webinar. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone.